This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More about them in a bit. I have set eyes on the wall of lofty Babylon, on which is a road for chariots, and the statue of Zeus of Alpheus, and the hanging gardens, and the colossus of the sun, and the huge labor of the high pyramids, and the vast tomb of Morsalus. But when I saw the house of Artemis that mounted to the clouds, those other marvels lost their brilliancy, and I said, Lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on aught so grand. That is how the Greek poet Antipater of Sidon described one of the original seven wonders of the world. It was the Temple of Artemis, a glorious Greek shrine to the mother goddess of the hunt, nature, the moon, and also chastity. In today's geographics, we're going to visit the ancient city where Artemis ruled the minds of her people for centuries. The magnificent city of Ephesus. The region surrounding Ephesus has been inhabited since the Neolithic era. This corresponds to modern-day Selkirk on the eastern Mediterranean coast of Turkey. Even 9,000 years ago, the area was prime real estate, close to the sea with access to spring water and a fertile hinterland. Naturally, humans settled there very early on. Artifacts dating back from the Neolithic, Chaitkolitic, and Early Bronze Age give us an idea of quite a sophisticated society. The presence of obsidian tools imported from the island of Milos and tuna fish bones are clues that these early inhabitants liked to travel and had the means to do so. They also had an established religious system centered around the worship of mother goddesses, deities associated with the presence of natural springs who look after crops and offer shelter to those in need. In the 3rd millennium BCE, the prehistoric settlement was abandoned. It is not clear why, but Hittite sources from the 2nd millennium mention the foundation of an urban center on Ayasuluk Hill, a city called Apasa. It may have been that Apasa simply attracted inhabitants from the surrounding areas, and it could be that the very name Apasa later morphed into Ephesus. During the first millennium BCE, the region of Apasa welcomed a growing number of Greek immigrants who would come to be known as Ionians. These migrants took in the local Anatolian culture, adopting and morphing some of their practices and beliefs. The Greeks adopted the religion of the local mother goddess, Kybel, and gave her the name Artemis. The fulcrum of her worship was not a temple, nor a shrine, not even a statue. Most likely, it was a simple lone tree stump at the center of a sacred grove on Mount Panayirdag. The grove was so important that several villages and small towns sprouted around it. These smaller centers would later coalesce into the larger city known as Ephesus. The stump was replaced by a temple in the 7th century BCE, and the grove gave way to what would become the Agora of Ephesus. As the city grew in size and importance, so did the cult of Artemis and her temple. It was the legendary Lydian king Croesus, richest of the rich, who ordered for a huge shrine to be erected around 550 BCE. Designed by the architect Chesiphron, the Temple of Artemis was entirely made of marble and measured some 115 meters in length and 55 meters in width. It was constructed on marshy ground so as not to be in danger from earthquakes, with the foundation laid on a bed of charcoal and sheepskins. The temple had 127 columns, each 18 meters high. The columns were arranged in a double row on all four sides, eight or nine on the short sides, and twenty or twenty-one on the long sides. Those columns on the facades were decorated with relief figures from Greek mythology. The decorative frieze of the temple carried scenes involving Amazons who were, in Greek mythology, supposed to have sought shelter at Ephesus from Hercules. Continuing this tradition, the temple was said to offer sanctuary to all those who were persecuted by justice, by injustice, or by invading armies. When the Persian Empire first invaded Anatolia, or modern-day Turkey, it was 547 BCE. Work at the temple had started only three years prior and would go on for more than a century. So Ephesians could not really seek sanctuary there just yet. Caught very literally between the mighty and protracted struggle that opposed the Persians and the Greek city-states, Ephesus opted for neutrality, a clever move which ensured that their city remained stable and prosperous during hard times. The ancient city clearly benefited from its coastal 
location. The port of Ephesus was one of the main trading hubs of the eastern Mediterranean and a natural gateway halfway between Greece and Persia, Europe and Asia. Moreover, the cult of Artemis continued to thrive, attracting thousands of visitors and pilgrims. That same cult received a hard blow in July 356 BCE, when the Great Temple was burned to the ground. According to legend, the fire took place on the night in which Alexander the Great was born. According to Plutarch, Artemis herself had left the shrine, assisting in the delivery of Alexander. The disaster had allegedly been the result of arson, committed by a man named Herostratus. His motive? Well, he just wanted to go down in history. Mission accomplished, we suppose. But next time, why not invent the horse mill or something? In reality, this story is probably more myth than fact. Herostratus may have never existed, and the fire may have been caused by something as mundane as a lightning bolt. The temple was rebuilt between 355 and 330 BCE. According to another myth, Alexander the Great offered to pay for the construction work when his troops entered Ephesus. But according to historian Strabo, the offer was refused by the Ephesians, who said that it was inappropriate for a god to dedicate offerings to gods. Now, that's how you do flattery. Ephesus again became a magnet for spiritual pilgrims who came to admire the new Temple of Artemis, one of the Seven Wonders of Antiquity. The city was not done with construction projects, though. After the death of Alexander, one of his generals, called Lysimachus, became ruler of the region. Around 320 BCE began a renewal and development plan for Ephesus. According to the plan, Ephesus was renamed. It was now Arsinea, after Lysimachus's wife, Arsino. Everything beyond the new name was a massive undertaking. First, Lysimachus ordered for the whole city to be moved three kilometers southwest to a more defensible area. The Ephesians were not thrilled about a relocation, so the crafty ruler had the sewage system blocked during a storm. When the citizens were ankle-deep in their own filth, they realized the new location was actually rather nice. Next, Lysimachus had the city and suburbs surrounded by a nine-kilometer-long fortification. He constructed a new harbor, as the old one could not cope with the burgeoning amount of shipping traffic and was also marked by constant silting. In 188 BCE, the city, named Ephesus once again, was under the rule of the Attalids, the kings of Pergamon, who expanded the harbor once again and gave the city its great theater. In 129 BC, the last king of Pergamon, Attalos, bequeathed Ephesus to the Roman Republic. This marked the beginning of a new phase for the city, where it would reach its cultural heights. And you know, it's pretty unlikely that anyone will ever bequeath you the perfect website for your big pet project or your side hustle. You're going to need to do that yourself. But fortunately, well, that's Squarespace. With the new year coming up, a couple of things you need to keep in mind. One, maybe you've got an idea for a website or a business or a podcast, something like that, knocking around in your mind. Well, two, the only way to figure out whether it's worth doing is to get it out there to the world. And I know that can be daunting because it's scary to pursue new things, but not knowing how to set up a website is no excuse. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. You want to sell something online? Yes. Set up a store with Squarespace. You want a podcast? Yes. Do it with Squarespace. That's just two examples. There are loads of things you can make. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template. Customize it to your heart's content, or if you want to start from scratch or move over from an existing domain, making everything easy to manage. And once you've gone through that easy customization process, no updates, no patches, no tech nonsense to deal with. In Squarespace, they'll send all the website -y stuff. I said they do podcasts already, but they also do mailing lists, social integrations, all of that stuff. It's all handled for you. Go get started today. You'll get 24 seven customer support. So if you get stuck, you'll get fixed up real easy. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Ephesus continued to explode in size, splendor, and importance. In time, it was named as the capital of the Roman province of Asia, which is mostly just modern-day Turkey. The drivers of this ever-increasing prestige were the commercial ports and the Temple of Artemis, which attracted both commercial activity and private benefactors. Under the management of the Romans, Ephesus was enriched with architectural wonders, some of which are still visible today. Buildings like the terrace slope houses, for example, private residences for the urban elite, or the Forum, modeled after the original in Rome, complete with its basilica and temples dedicated to the emperors. This prosperity, however, shouldn't fool us, as Ephesus did go through some pretty hard times. 
Forty years after the onset of Roman rule in 88 BCE, Ephesians rebelled against their rulers and the high taxes they imposed. They welcomed Mithridates, king of Pontus, as a liberator. His armies entered Ephesus, and with the help of the local population, they massacred tens of thousands of Latin-speaking citizens. The city was soon reconquered by the ruthless and skilled Roman general Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Sulla stormed the city in 84 BCE, allowing his soldiers to sack Ephesus, then arranging for the rebels to be tried and executed. Ephesus had to withstand another type of trial somewhere between 17 and 23 CE, when a massive earthquake inflicted severe damage on the city. While contending with revolts, invasions, and earthquakes, Ephesus had to deal with yet another enemy, this one silent but tenacious, Silt. The gradual and continuous process of sedimentation in the Bay of Ephesus needed to be addressed. With help from Rome, the basins and the canals of the port were cleaned and dredged constantly, lest the harbour become unstable and the city lose a major economic lifeline. The Romans also helped Ephesians in rebuilding the city after the earthquake. Thanks to massive civic engineering investment, Ephesus appeared richer than ever. According to historian Aristio, the city maintained its status as the most important centre for trade and culture in Asia, attracting many of the best and brightest minds from across the Mediterranean. Among them was an orator from Tarsus, modern-day southeastern Turkey. He was traveling the length of the empire, spreading the tenets of a new religion that he had once helped persecute. He was born as Saul, but reborn as Paul or Saint Paul as we know him today. Arriving in Ephesus in 52 CE, Paul addressed its citizens several times in an effort to convert them to Christianity. He did so via letters, which are now part of the New Testament, or in person through public speeches in houses of worship. An apocryphal tradition features Paul speaking to crowds of pagans at the Great Theatre, one of the jewels of the Ephesian crown, a marble structure still splendidly preserved. But the reality is actually different. Paul had managed to gather numerous law followers thanks to his oratory skills. So many, in fact, as to threaten the worship of Artemis and the related businesses flourishing around the temple. One business owner in particular was not happy about it. This was the jeweler Demetrius, who had built his wealth on the commerce of silver statues of the goddess. Feeling threatened by the new religion, he had assembled thousands of pagans and staged a massive anti-Christian protest at the Great Theatre. Paul intended to show up at the theatre and confront the pagans, but was dissuaded from doing so by his followers who feared for his safety. Paul would die as a martyr some 15 years later in Rome, but that day the theatre crowds were spared a gruesome spectacle of death. And that, to be honest, was quite commonplace at the Great Theatre, as it was home to a reliable Roman staple, gladiatorial combat. The Great Theatre was first built by the Attalids, and it was later expanded by the Romans from 41 to 117 CE. At its apex, the theatre had a width of 145 metres, and the highest order of seats stood at 30 metres high. Up to 24,000 spectators could enjoy the shows on stage. The theatre was used to stage comedies, tragedies, and even more spectacular events. Some studies suggest that water ducts may have been used to flood the amphitheatre to stage spectacular mock naval battles. One type of show that did take place for certain were gladiatorial fights. The first ones were held in 69 CE under the patronage of Roman governor Lucullus. Gladiators enjoyed a special status, much like sports stars today, and even had a dedicated cemetery at the foot of Panayota Hill. Discovered in 1993, the graveyard was the object of a fascinating study published in 2009 by two researchers of Vienna Medical University, Fabian Kanz and Karl Groschmidt. Like CSI detectives on a very, very cold case, they identified the remains of 68 individuals, of which 66 were males aged between 20 and 30. Several of these men presented massive perimortal traumas or injuries occurring at or near the time of death. Three of them presented fractures on their skulls, indicating their opponents had smashed their shields on their faces. Evidence that, like Roman legionaries, gladiators used their shield as an offensive weapon. Ten more bodies revealed fatal traumas on the skull dealt by other means. Considering the quality of helmets worn by gladiators, this high rate of head injuries appeared suspicious to Cannes and Groschmidt. They linked these clues to contemporary accounts of mortally wounded gladiators being finished off with a death blow struck by an arena servant with a hammer. In a touch of morbid theatrics, this servant was apparently dressed as the Roman god of the underworld 
world. The Vienna team continued their analysis to identify the weapons used by the Ephesian gladiators. The majority of the injuries point to the use of standard gladiatorial weapons, such as the gladius or the trident. But a single finding showed four small, equal imprints, each separated by a distance of just over a centimeter. These lesions are compatible with the cubic fordent, a legendary weapon similar to modern-day brass knuckles and anecdotally used in the eastern provinces of the empire. The use of the fordent suggests that some gladiators engaged in combat at very close range. Further inspection of the bones showed that the arena fighters enjoyed great medical care. 26 individuals showed perfectly healed injuries all over their bodies, from the skull to the radius, further proof that gladiators were costly commodities and that death in the arena was a much rarer occurrence than Ridley Scott would like us to believe. In fact, death or severe injury may have been a secondary worry to Ephesian gladiators. Their main concern, apparently, might have been tooth decay. The stars of the Great Theatre had a much higher incidence of painful cavities compared to non-combatants. The reason may have been reduced saliva production due to sustained physical and psychological stress. It's difficult not to experience a dry mouth when Maximus wants to bash your skull in. Another cause may have been the gladiatorial diet, which was pulpy and rich in carbs. Their muscular physique may lead you to believe the gladiators gorged on protein-rich meat, but the Vienna team found high levels of strontium in their bones. And the more meat you eat, the less strontium. The conclusion is that Ephesian fighters followed an almost vegan diet consisting of barley and pulses, so high-quality carbs for quick bursts of energy coupled with plant-based protein. This is consistent with a nickname frequently associated with gladiators, Horidari, or barley men. In addition to these vegan meals, Ephesian gladiators integrated their diets with a sort of energy drink, a mineral supplement concocted with bone ash. The Roman years were good to the Ephesians, who enjoyed three centuries of relative tranquility. But 2,000 years ago, nothing ever stayed good for too long, and Ephesus was long overdue for a bit of a serving of catastrophe. The year 262 CE was a terrible one for Ephesians. This is when another earthquake hit, this time much harder than in previous years. The city was reduced almost entirely to rubble. The public buildings that remained standing faced the wrath of a Gothic invasion force who descended on the city in the same year. Among other masterpieces, the Goths burned down the Library of Celsus, second in importance only to its peer in Alexandria. The library was built between 114 and 117 CE in honor of Tiberius Julius Cellus Polymanius, a senator, general, and proconsul of Ephesus. The library stood at the very heart of the city, just by the Agora. It was built in the style prevalent under Emperor Hadrian. This was a style that placed emphasis on highly decorative facades, with multiple tiers, false windows, Corinthian pillars, relief carvings, and statues. The facade of the library, still visible, is 21 meters wide. However, it was built to appear even wider by having the lower floor rest on a gently convex podium and by using slightly smaller columns at the sides. The library had three entrances, each topped with a window and flanked by statues set inside niches. There are four statues in total, representing four qualities associated with the late Celsus, as well as the institution of the library – wisdom, intelligence, knowledge, and virtue. The interior of the library covered about 180 square meters of floor space, paved with richly decorated marble. The walls were lined with niches, storing around 12,000 precious scrolls, which were intended to be consulted on the spot. I can imagine how ancient Ephesians procrastinated for hours on end while scrolling forever on these ancient texts. The interior, now lost, must have been light and airy as the entrance was exposed to the east. This guaranteed exposure to natural light and a dry environment, ideal to preserve the scrolls. Despite the external appearance, there was no no second floor inside the library. Instead, there was just a raised balcony running around the interior wall at the second story level. This gave access to further niches and shelves. The storage units were alternated with empty niches, another effective measure to protect the vessels of knowledge from excess humidity. But what of excessive fire? Five years after the flames had consumed the library, the Goths returned. This time, they burned down what had been the symbol of Ephesus, its major landmark, the Temple of Artemis. 
The 4th century CE was indeed a dark era for Ephesians. After the earthquake and the Goth invasion, they lived among rubble for decades. Heavily damaged structures were only superficially restored, but no new buildings were erected. A program of reconstruction only started in the early 5th century CE under Theodosius II, Roman Emperor in the East. By now, the empire had adopted Christianity as its main religion, and so the emperor put great emphasis on sacred buildings, but he did find the time and money to restore the Library of Celsus to its its previous glory. Christianity paid great importance to the written word in the form of sacred texts and commentaries as opposed to the oral tradition of pagan beliefs. To that end, the library played a key role in preserving and disseminating Christian thought in Asia Minor. In the meantime, the cult of Artemis had disappeared, but a new age of Christian pilgrimage brought renown and wealth back to Ephesus. Visitors were attracted by holy places, such as the Basilica of St. John the Apostle, believed to have died in Ephesus. Another lesser-known shrine was the Cemetery of the Seven Sleepers. The Sleepers, which are also mentioned in the Quran, were seven pious young men who had sealed themselves in a cave during the persecutions of Christians. After the decades of sleeping, they had emerged still youthful in a world where Christianity had supplanted paganism. But the most attractive site for visitors was the House of the Virgin Mary, who, according to tradition, spent her last years of life in Ephesus. This tradition originates from the New Testament itself. While dying on the cross, Jesus pointed at John and said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. According to historical writings, John later came to Ephesus where he finally died. It is assumed that he brought with him his adopted mother. According to this tradition, Mary lived there until her assumption, according to Catholic doctrine, or Dormition, according to the Orthodox beliefs. However, the evidence that Mary lived in Ephesus is not very strong, and other sources indicate that her final home was in Jerusalem. The worship of the Virgin Mary in Ephesus may, in fact, be a simple thematic continuation of previous pagan beliefs. Life in the ancient city had always revolved around the worship of female and maternal deities, from the early Anatolian goddess to Artemis. It was not uncommon in Paleo-Christian times for attributes of local pagan deities to be merged with stories of the early saints. It was similar, typical for early Christian communities to completely wipe out any vestige of previous religions. Based on the works of Christian poet Paulinus of Nola, we know that around 402 CE, what was left of the Temple of Artemis, the Seventh Wonder, was completely dismantled, torn down piece by piece by a mob of monks, priests, and ordinary citizens. According to Cyril, Patriarch of Alexandria, this act of religious violence was against the wishes and the laws of the emperor in Constantinople. Instead, the instigator had been the archbishop of that city, John Kairos Ostrom. Cyril of Alexandria later visited Ephesus in 431 CE to preside over the Third Council of Christian Bishops. The council was convened to solve the dispute created by Nestorianism, a doctrine which claims that the Virgin Mary should be considered the mother of Christ, but not of God. The council eventually decreed that Mary was to be recognized as the mother of God and declared Nestorianism to be heresy. Mary's prominence gave Ephesus a sort of spiritual full-circle story, from its status as home of the mother goddess all the way to the city where Mary was recognized as mother of God. But by the following century, Ephesus was again on the decline. For a time, it had been an important garrison town within the Byzantine Empire, but then other centers like Samos and Smyrna took over it in terms of political and military prominence. In the meanwhile, incessant silting of the harbor had forced the once glorious city to finally capitulate. As the Romans used to say, Gutta carvat lapidem. In other words, drop by drop, water can carve the stone. In the case of Ephesus, grain by grain, sand and mud had taken over the water, killing the viability of the commercial port. The old city of Ephesus was completely abandoned in the 14th century, and its few remaining inhabitants settled in the nearby Alasulak Hill. Ephesus may have been abandoned, but was never forgotten, celebrated in historiography and literature. To name just one example, William Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors is set in Ephesus. But it took centuries before its ruins were rediscovered by British architect John Turtle Wood, who led excavations there from 1863 to 1874 on behalf of the British Museum. Today, the archaeological site is a UNESCO World Heritage Site definitely worth visiting. If you have been lucky enough to see the Great Theatre, the Library of Celsus, or the lone surviving column of the Temple of Artemis, let us know in the comments. And as usual, thank you for watching. Please do check out our fantastic sponsor. There is a link below, and I'll see you next time.